welcome everyone. We're glad you can join us today. We'll give just a little bit for everybody to get signed in and then we'll get started. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to another week of Cypher Conversations. My name is Katie Shuck. I am the Executive Outreach Director for Cypher at Dakota State University. And we are thrilled to have you joining us today. This week we have Bud, Buzz Hillstead from Cy uh, SBS Cybersecurity, which is in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And we are um, just excited to hear what he has to say, but just a little bit of logistics before we get going. If you do have a question to ask Buzz, you can go ahead and put that in the Q&A that you should find at the bottom of the screen. And so without further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Buzz. All right. Well, thank you, Katie. And thanks for having us or having me here, rather. <laughs> I'm so used to saying us because I work with a group of people. So, um, well, again, my name is Buzz and uh, I got that name from my dad when I was four. It wasn't, it's not the name that's on my birth certificate, but it's the name that stuck and that I used for the rest of my life. So um, that's, that's a pretty interesting story. Um, I got my start in IT really, really early. Um, before IT was a thing, uh, when I was a kid, um, people were always bringing me broken record players and broken radios and stuff, and I would play with them and make different stuff out of them or fix them, um, that kind of stuff. All the way back to, I think, when I was in fifth grade, I remember just tinkering with electronics. And um, you get shocked quite a bit when you, when you do that, when you don't know what you're doing. So... Um, that was a fun experience. Uh, about 1996, I was in midst, my midst of high school back then, and we started uh, doing computer repair locally for people that just needed help. Uh, computers were fairly new back then and um, not necessarily uh, super powerful like the ones, the ones you have in your pocket right now, your cell phone, are probably a thousand times more powerful than what we had back in the in the mid 90s. Um, and the only way to get on the internet was AOL <laughs> for those of us in uh, central South Dakota. So um, you'd literally uh, dial up on the telephone. And if you were using the internet, your mom and dad could not use the, the telephone and there were no cell phones. So um, it was pretty problematic uh, trying to download. I remember trying to download a three meg picture once um, that one of my friends sent me and it took a little over three and a half hours. Uh, to download that. So now you guys get your three meg pictures instantly, uh, which is interesting. So um, 96. So uh, in high school, we, we uh, had a computer class and it was called Advanced Computers. Uh, really fascinating name there, I know. Uh, but uh, we had a teacher and his name was Bob Gill. And he, I, I believe he's still in Pier. Uh, his wife is the mayor of Pier, Lori Gill. Um, and a uh, good dude uh, taught us a lot of stuff, let us really kind of explore uh, computers. Um, back then, you couldn't just put a piece of hardware into a computer and have it work all the time. Uh, there were these things called interrupt requests. And so um, uh, the IRQs, the interrupt requests, you'd have to set them properly for your sound card to work or for your video card to work. Um, pretty interesting stuff. but. Um, then fast forward uh, after high school, um, I went to uh, Dakota State University and graduated from there with a degree in computer information systems, um, which was half programming, half computers, and uh, well, I would say half programming and half business, um, which was good because I didn't know really anything about business. Um, both of my parents were teachers growing up, so I learned a lot from them. Uh, had a good a good childhood, those types of things. Um, Dakota State was an interesting experience for me. What you guys have, uh, are, those of you that go to Dakota State or want to go to Dakota State, um, what you have today is amazing compared to what we had to choose from back then. Uh, and it wasn't, honestly, it doesn't, doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but um, Dr. Josh Pauli there at Dakota State University and I were uh, in school together and we would always go talk to the people in charge and say, hey, we want to learn about Active Directory. We want to learn about networks. Um, we want to learn how to set information systems up, um, not only program COBOL and, and program C++ and that kind of stuff. 
So a lot of that stuff started to, um, started to move, I guess, way back then. And then other people kind of carried the torch since then. And Josh stayed there kind of through the whole time. And now you have this amazing, not only computer science school, uh, not only business school, but you have this amazing cybersecurity school there. So um, just giving a plug to DSU, really done a good job in becoming what I wanted it to be when I, when I was <laughs> in college. Um, so unfortunately, I missed out on that. But uh, while I was in college, I had an internship with the state of South Dakota, um, which was fantastic because they have about 14 to 16,000 employees. Uh, across the state and um, our very large information systems. And so I was able to work in those information systems in integration, migrating, putting up networks, putting up uh, big storage area networks, um, uh, big websites, um, those types of things. So it was fantastic experience. Uh, after I graduated from college, I went on to work with them for a couple years and I started uh, my own business in IT. And through that business in IT, I got hired on with a hospital system in Pierre, Pierre, South Dakota. And that hospital system, um, I was hired on to be a contractor to build their electronic medical record system. And today you guys all know that as a system that um, uh, keeps your medical records and, and sends all your information to, to other various parts of uh, medical places, facilities all over the United States and all over the world. Um, but back in 2005, that was a very new thing. And we were on the forefront of actually putting in electronic medical records. And our CEO that wanted to do it was somebody that was considered a visionary in that, um, that field. So uh, lots of IT in in 2004, because of the HIPAA, the Health Information, uh, uh, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, um, it required that those health records, as they were going online and as they were becoming electronic, that they be secured and kept private. And um, that's where I really got my interest in security was in 2004. So I had been doing IT for yep, probably about eight years before that happened. And I was like, man, security is fascinating um, because all this stuff, I could just see that all this stuff is going to be a problem if, if it's not secured. Well, fast forward to 2008, 2009, 2010, um, we started seeing some of the very first hackers uh, accessing information. Um, and we were trying to figure out how to protect our networks from it. Um, and, you know, back in, even back in, uh, 2000, I want to say 2003 and four, um, we had uh, viruses that came out and stuff like that. Nothing like it, that's out today. Um, but there were some pretty interesting things that we had to deal with back then. So I spent um, most of that time um, protecting networks and, and doing that thing, that sort of thing. And then I got into doing risk assessments again with my own personal company. And that's when I met uh, Chad, Knudsen and John Waldman at SBS and we started a side company called Helix Security and um, since SBS was involved in the banking sector uh, and I was uh, uh, involved with the healthcare stuff um, we just did healthcare and Helix Security and SBS did their the banking stuff so it's a good relationship and then uh, I want to say in 2015-2016 a man by the name of Aaron Gamewell came on at SBS and Aaron basically wanted to take those two companies and merge them because he said it's silly to do to do security just for banking and just for healthcare. Why not do security for everybody? So we did that. And uh, in, in the new company structure, I was, um, you know, uh, helping other consultants uh, do risk assessments, helping other consultants um, uh, figure out how to secure networks and that kind of thing. But I really, really, really wanted to get back into protecting networks from hackers directly. Um, and the fact when you do, when you are a consultant, you have the ability to work for a lot of different businesses. Um, I think over the last seven or eight years, I've probably worked for over 300 different businesses. Um, so it's, it's great the exposure that you get to, to people doing different types of things in, in security all over the, 
um, all over the uh, United States and in some cases in parts of the world. Um, but uh, it, it's just, I had a lot of good experience. And so I really wanted to get back to that protecting network. So I started a department in SBF, uh, SBS called uh, Digital Forensics and Incident Response, the DFIR department. And in digital forensics, that is a, a science in and of itself where you're looking at what happened on a device and you're trying to be able to tell a story and scientifically prove what happened on that device. In incident response, we do the same thing, but it's on a network, okay? So we try to see how an attacker got in, how are they uh, maintaining access, what are they doing, are they exfiltrating data, um, how can we contain this incident, and then how can we eradicate it and get them off the network and make sure that they can't come back in. Um, so that's what I do now, uh, I have a team of, uh, it's a fairly small team, there's three of us, um, uh, four of us, because Kanthi, who was on the call, is actually an intern with us, so that's fantastic. Um, but uh, we get to go all over the U.S. and help um, businesses fight hackers, which is great. Um, when I was a kid, besides messing with hardware and, and computer stuff, I wanted to be a superhero. <laughs> and I get to be a superhero. So that's, that's fantastic. It's great. I don't have any, any powers, like I can't teleport and, uh, you know, those types of things. Um, but um, we do, we are able to do some pretty amazing things with the companies that we work with. So uh, it's fun, fascinating. Um, and if you're ever interested in uh, learning more about DFIR or cybersecurity, just let me know some of my information's on the, uh, the screen here. Uh, feel free to text or email me if you so choose to do so. Oh, good. And I forgot to introduce Kanthi too at the beginning. <laughs> so Kanthi Narakonda is our Cyber Outreach Director. And so she is actually going to be facilitating the Q&A here. So I know she already had some pre-submitted questions and I see some popping up in our Q&A. So again, if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A, but take it away, Kanthi. Seriously, people. Buzz is like a treasure trove of knowledge. He knows about everything. So keep the questions coming. So, Buzz, I have quite a few questions for you already. Awesome. So, as part of your job, do you get to travel a lot? Yes, um, I get to travel a lot 90% of the time, and I have to travel a lot 10% of the time. So, <laughs> that's the way I like to say it. So, it's, it's kind of a, a double-edged sword, uh, if you will. Um, we, uh, we, we're actually on a travel ban because of COVID. So we've, we've created some new processes and some new, uh, technology to be able to do some of the things that we're used to doing in person remotely. Um, but yeah, I get to, I get to travel all over. I think that probably 70, 70% 70 of my job was travel up before March. So, um, and you know, SBS, we have all types of different jobs. You can travel a lot. There's people that travel more than we do. There's auditors that go to 42 locations a year. So 42 out of the 52 weeks every year, they're on site someplace new. Um, they travel even more than I do. But um, uh, when I get to go to a location, it's high intensity. Um, people are generally tr trying not to fall apart. Um, they're freaked out about uh, the hackers that are in their network, what they're doing. Uh, are they going to lose their job? That kind of stuff. And so it's really important when I get there to try to pull everybody back together and try to focus them and uh, direct them in, in the, the specific things that we need to do uh, while I'm on site. Great question. Awesome. So what's the coolest thing that you've ever done? Oh, um, wow. The coolest thing that I've ever done. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to stick to cybersecurity on that one. Um, I think the coolest thing I ever done I, I've ever done was we had a customer that was an aerospace engineering firm that was under attack, and this was uh, not this not this year, but uh, last summer, last June, so a year ago, June. Um, a multi-billion dollar company. They were suffering a million dollars a day in downtime, and uh, we went out there. They were probably one hour from losing their entire company and having to close their doors. 
um, we went out there and helped them and in eight days, um, it was like it never happened. So uh, the difference we can make in a business and I still have the, the owner of that company is a billionaire and he calls me uh, a couple of times a year since then and, and asked me how I'm doing and stuff like that. It's pretty amazing. So I do remember this incident, like when you yeah. were gone and I remember thinking, Oh my God, this has got to be so draining and so exhilarating at the same time to be able to help such a huge company. Yep. And that's part of the reason why I stay in really good shape because, um, at, at that incident, it was eight days straight. Uh, and we got about four hours of sleep a night. So your adrenaline is kicking the whole time. And then when you sleep, you sleep really hard, but then you got to wake up and do it all again on, on low sleep. And your body does start to deteriorate and your mind is, is usually not far, not long past it. So. So is your work different now than in the early 2000s due to the technology evolving? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, back then I wouldn't have even been able to fathom and envision the stuff that I'm, I'm doing right now. Um, you know, we had some, the guys and I, when I worked back at the state of South Dakota in the early two thousands, we had some predictions of, of what the future would hold. Um, and, and some of them were pretty close, but uh, a lot of them were way off. You know, I guess, you know, in the 80s, anybody that was that's old enough to live back in the 80s, everybody told us we were going to have robots in the year 2000 that would do everything for us. So um, reality is a little bit short of expectation as far as robots goes. Uh, but man, you can do just about anything from a phone in your pocket right now. And that's just crazy. I never would have thought that to be a, a, a possibility. I would, like, I would like to see a, like a fully functioning robot. Heck That'd be yeah. kind of cool. I thought we'd have robots by now. <laughs> I think I thought so too. But I don't know. So you work in incident response, right? So has there ever been a situation where you were on vacation, but you had to leave or come back because there was an incident with a client and you had to be there? Yes. Yeah, that happens um, quite often, actually. Um, good question. Uh, and, you know, we don't expect that of our employees, but that's, that's why we're building a team. But back when the DFIR team was just me, um, you know, I would, I'd be on vacation and, and we'd get a call and I'd say, sorry, we gotta, gotta ditch out and go. And my family understands, um, my kids are really good. Uh, they know that, that dad has to go do crazy stuff sometimes. So, um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's, I don't call this a job as much as I call it a lifestyle. It's definitely a, more of a lifestyle. I like that. The lifestyle thing. It <laughs> really is. So my follow up to that question is how do you balance your work life and your home life? So, um, I do a lot of things um, in my personal life that aren't, uh, I guess, so let me, let me back up my interests. I'm a very nerdy geeky person by nature. I love technology. I love, um, computers. Uh, a lot of the time that I spend in my personal time is actually doing the same stuff I do for work. Um, it's just trying to figure out how to do it more efficiently trying to figure out innovative processes. Um, I write PowerShell scripts um, to automate things. Uh, it's, just, it's just trying to, I guess, get better at, at what I'm doing for a job. So, um, and I love it. Like, I don't, if you love what you do, you're never gonna feel like you're working. You're gonna feel like you're playing all the time. And that's, that's kind of the way, there's some things I feel like I'm doing work for sure. Um, it's not, it's not hundred percent of playtime all the time, but, um, a lot of the time I don't feel like I'm working as much as I'm just geeking out and, and doing the things I love to do. That being said, I do have to, um, uh, create hobbies and interests that are away from the computer. Um, I do shoot guns. Um, uh, my buddies and I have, uh, handguns and, and rifles that we go out and shoot, um, for fun and for practice. 
Uh, I do lift a lot of weights. Um, six days a week, I'm doing weights and cardio. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, in my kids, um, I am divorced and my kids uh, are with me every other weekend, every other holiday and six weeks in the summer. Um, so I think that that, uh, that presents a situation where I can work a lot more than than most other people who are parents, um, fortunately and unfortunately at the same time. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it is what it is, but uh, I do work a lot. Uh, I do spend a lot of time doing work stuff, but um, I like to have fun and I like to be with my family too, so. Awesome. So in this line of work, it has got to be really difficult when you're dealing with so many bad guys from so many different sides. So. Has there ever been an instance where you were able to talk to one of the hackers? Um, well, we we don't generally do that. So uh, a lot of times with ransomware, they want ransom. And so um, there's attorneys that get involved and they talk. They can, they're the ones that communicate with hackers. Just on principle, I won't, I won't talk to them. I know obviously they they keep me in work and keep me doing my job, um, which is, I guess, a positive thing uh, out of the whole negative thing, you know, the negative stuff that they do. But um, on principle, I, I, I call them financial terrorists. I mean, that's really what they are. So uh, it's very adversarial and I feel like, um, like I'm doing good work and, and work on the mission, so. So what's the worst hacking situation you've ever had to deal with? Um, full network takeover. Uh, this was two years ago, January. So 2017, uh, three years ago. Yeah. So 2017 timeframe. Um, there was a large, uh, and, and I'm not going to say the name cause you guys would totally recognize it. And obviously we got to keep that confidential but there was a large um, fast food um, industry and their network was just about completely taken over and they didn't even know about it. The FBI told them. And by the time we got in there and started looking around and, and seeing what the, the attackers were doing and how long they've been in there, they had been in there for 13 months. So over a year and they had taken over just about every main server they had taken over very specific workstations and even taken over people's cell phones. Wow, 13 months. And that was a mess. That was a, a huge, huge mess. And um, their third party IT that we worked with on it, um, we basically gave them a plan to fix it. And the third party IT um, took that plan to the uh, to the business, and then it was up to the business to to decide to do it or not. And obviously, it had a pretty big price tag because it was rip and replace a lot of stuff. And um, the containment plan, we we contain everything and we eradicate everything. But then it's a it's a matter of making sure that that doesn't come back. Uh, it's maintaining that eradication state, and that's hard for some companies because it can be very costly. You have to put in new technology and new hardware and that kind of stuff. So on the um, presentation that you had earlier, there was something called deceive the bad guys. So we have a question about that. How do you deceive the bad guys? So um, I like to say disrupt and deceive the bad guys. So by, uh, if, you, if you know, um, or maybe you don't know, the bad guys are essentially organized crime syndicates all over the world that operate and they have, they're, they're basically like a business. Okay. So they are doing ransomware. They're doing phishing. They're getting in, in the middle of bank transactions. Um, they're buying and selling, uh, uh, protected health information so they can commit fraud with that. Um, just doing really bad stuff, but it's very profitable and that's why they do it. And so disrupting them, obviously we're, we're, shutting their ability or their capability to do that stuff down um, by helping these companies that call us and say, hey, we have a, uh, an incident and we need you guys to come respond. Deceiving the bad guys is, is, is in that same vein, but it's a little bit different. So 
Um, I don't know if any, the, the people that ask that question, if you've heard of what a honeypot is, um, a honeypot is a device or a server you can put a piece of software you can put on your network and that looks like something that's very hackable and has a lot of hack, uh, good hackable information um, and, you know, some flaws in it that bad guys can, can go in and, and check out. We have a number of those devices so we can monitor how bad guys are getting into networks and we can pull data on that. Um, we can see what malware they're trying to place on networks because um, every once in a while we see something come down that, that we haven't seen before, um, which is great. So it's from an educational standpoint, we're deceiving them and, and getting them uh, to give us some of their keys to their kingdoms and some of, the, some of their processes and some of their software and stuff that they're using, they're actually leaving for us to study. <laughs> so um, it, it, there is a little bit of a deception there they think they're hacking into something, um, that's what we want them to think and that's what we want them to do. Nice. So have you worked with law enforcement agencies or other government or military entities? And so if yeah. you did, how is working with them different from working in the private sector? You bet. So um, in the private sector, everything's a lot more open. Uh, information goes both ways. Uh, it's it's very, you know, everybody's talking to each other and trying to figure it out. Um, we've worked with both the Department of Defense and the FBI and the NSA on, on certain projects. And um, it's very hard to get those people to tell you any information back. So they were like, you know, the, the particular incident I'm thinking about where we worked with the FBI, they're like, we want to know what you found. Um, how did you find it? Uh, you know, what did you do to arrive to these decisions? Um, that kind of stuff. And then we're like, um, okay, you know, here's all of our stuff. This is what we did. This is how we arrived at the decisions. Now, what did you guys find? Silence. <laughs> so, uh, they, they don't necessarily share things back the other way. Um, it is pretty fascinating to work, uh, work with them on stuff though. And I do have a buddy at the FBI now that I kind of got through the process of, of working with them on stuff. Um, and, uh, we talk every once in a while about, um, you know, what's going on in the, in the cyber world and that kind of stuff. So, um, the, the department of defense was even more hush hush, uh, than the FBI. The FBI, I feel like is a little bit more open. Um, you know, they have their processes and a lot of times in cases, they can't talk about a case, especially when it's under investigation. Um, the FBI is doing a lot of stuff with putting moles in these uh, organized crime syndicates. And so they don't want to expose the fact that they might have somebody in the organization that's hacking into the company that you're trying to protect. Um, and, you know, if, if that type of cloak and dagger uh, stuff really appeals to you, um, FBI and Department of Defense and NSA, they're all hiring people left and right. Um, you know, the sixth branch of the military, the cyber defense uh, under the Obama administration was put into effect. Um, they're hiring people left and right, and they're doing a lot of offensive stuff against countries that are doing offensive stuff to us. So if you want to do some really crazy offensive stuff, you can, or if you want to be uh, a, a defender like, like I am, you sure can too. So the, the world is wide open right now. That's true. There's like a ton of opportunities for just about anything. Absolutely. And so with that, our last question to you is how can youth, preferably K to 12, get started to prepare for a higher education or for a beginning in cyber? Uh, get some books. You don't even need to get books anymore. Just go online and start looking for stuff like um, PowerShell is a really good scripting language that is very powerful and allows us to automate a lot of the stuff that we look for in forensics and incident response. Um, there's even a whole, uh, somebody's even built an entire PowerShell forensics um, uh, a batch of subroutines out there. Um, and I forget what the project is. That's a good way to get started. If you want to look more on the offensive side, like uh, penetration testing, that kind of stuff, Python is a good language to, to get started with. You don't have to just focus on programming languages though. There's so much content on YouTube that's relevant and valuable. 
Um, if you go out to uh, a lot of cybersecurity companies like us, put free education on our website, uh, go out there and check it out, um, download stuff, uh, just start studying it and find, there's so many avenues to go with cybersecurity right now. Um, just find something that interests you in there and then just really start to, to break it apart and, and think about it and investigate it and figure out how those tools work. Um, right now in digital forensics, um, there's a guy named Eric Zimmerman who puts out, he's a former FBI agent, who puts out a ton of free tools to do forensics. Anything you can do with your, um, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 a year tools, you can do with his tools. It's just a little bit more complicated. Good. Well, thank you, Buzz. We are so excited that you um, were able to impart your words of wisdom and your background. Um, I know I learned a lot more about DFIR, and I hope that everybody here did as well. Um, for those that we didn't get to answer your questions, since there are still a couple left in the Q&A, and I, I'm not sure how many we had that were pre-submitted that weren't answered, um, but if you want to go ahead, like Buzz said, just give, contact him. He's got his phone number, his email there. Um, so you can reach out to him and get those questions answered.